This video is gonna be a bit of an atypical one. So if you're here for the Beyond Order or Irreversible Damage Deconstruction, feel free to sit this one out. We will return to the regularly scheduled program in the near future, just some real life stuff is getting in the way and I want to talk about it. So functionally, this video is going to be an update on a video I made a while ago about my chronic pain condition, trigeminal neuralgia, if you're so inclined, and the medical drama that just seems to follow it because of course, that drama has flared up again. So I have a couple goals of what I want this video to be. First is just an explanation so I can stop being so vague about what this medical drama is I've been dealing with since the end of last year. Most medical things I would keep private, but this, fine, I can talk about it. Second, as another form of explanation of why I'm going to be radio silent for a week or two, because uh, the situation has taken some toll on me emotionally, so I'm just going to need some time to process everything. Third, because as the Human Rights Watch has been reporting on, the U.S. has been hurting chronic pain patients in a botched attempt to try to deal with the opioid epidemic. I am potentially a data point there, so maybe sharing my story will help. And to set communication expectations early, this is a venting video. I'm not looking for treatment options or medication suggestions or things of that nature, so the thought's appreciated, but save yourself the typing. Realistically, I have barked up those trees. I have barked up so many trees in the process of dealing with this, so thank you, but save the typing. I'm also not really even looking for sympathy with this. Um, I just want to explain sort of where I've been mentally and why I've been withdrawing and not as responsive to things as I'd like to be. So if you've DM'd me on like Twitter or Discord or something and I haven't responded, this is a huge chunk of why. To borrow the metaphor from a friend, this isn't a fire I need help putting out. I just want to talk about the fire. What I've got is a form of trigeminal neuralgia. And so basically you have a bunch of nerves innervating your face that come out from the brainstem and the trigeminal nerve is one that comes down this way. And if it gets messed with just right, you can end up with a chronic pain condition. There's no good chronic pain condition, but if Google's anything to go by, this is a bad one to get. And the best I can figure, I got it with a wisdom tooth extraction that was full bony. Like they had to dig in to pull out the teeth and either the tooth was touching the nerve or involved with the nerve or they nicked the nerve. I don't know, but it seems to have been the thing that did it. My pain from this comes in two forms. There's flare ups and there's constant pain. And the flare-ups are complicated to explain, and I've gotten better at it over the years. So in a flare-up episode, the pain I'm experiencing increases dramatically. Um, on the pain chart, I'd call it probably a six or seven, but realistically, I don't know if pain could be worse, especially when it's stabbing. But uh, it ramps up to be very bad, and in those badness, there will be instances where it just gets even worse and just it's like the nerve is just misfiring or something and it hurts so bad. Uh, and then it'll calm down and it'll get bad again, calm down, get bad, calm down. And it just sort of cycles in the middle of this flare up. And when it first started, you know, this could last like an hour. And now it can last a good part of a day. And the constant pain happened when I had a flare up that lasted for over two days and only stopped when I went to the ER and got a shot of morphine. Ever since then, I've had just this constant pain in the background. Unmedicated, it will sit around a four or five. Medicated with the pain medication, which is the center of this drama, it can get down to like a two. This will be relevant later, but the pain is sort of centered in like that much from this spot and it radiates back and up. And that's, that's where my pain be at. So when I say I can relate to Jordan Peterson's medical journey, I'm not kidding or being hyperbolic. I've been dealing with this since the mid aughts. Like it's coming up on 20 years here. And I've been dealing with a medical system that can seem obstructive or callously uninterested for almost as long. And given the existence of this video, the shit's hit the fan again. 
This current iteration has been going on for a while. Like, we're coming up on the half-year mark, and it's still not resolved. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. This past December, I got a letter from my HMO letting me know that my primary care physician was leaving and I was being automatically assigned a new one. Don't worry about it. It's fine. It's all handled. And I should mention that the primary care physician who left had been treating this with Percocet. It's something that I started in 2015 and it was initially supposed to be a band-aid, but it seems to be the thing that works the best in managing the pain with the most manageable side effects for me. So that's, that's why all of the drama is because of that medication. In January was the first refill request of the pain medication under the new doctor. And so I did it the way I had done it for a year where you go in the app, in the pharmacy section, push the little refill request and it goes and it pings the doctor, lets them know, hey, patient wants a refill, and then they can approve it with the pharmacy. I did this three or four days in advance because there was a weekend and a holiday. I did it well in advance, and either the doctor didn't see it or it got misdirected because the app can be a bit buggy. On the day it was supposed to be filled, and I am there on the day it's supposed to be filled because I can only get one month's supply at a time. Like, there is, there is no wiggle room. So if I'm missing a refill, that means I'm missing medication. Unhappy camper. So the day it's supposed to be filled, no signs of movement. I call the pharmacy to see if they know what's going on and they haven't received anything from the doctor yet, but they can see my request. So they send a message to the doctor and also say that I should ping her as well. So I sent her a message letting her know like, hey, I had submitted a request, you know, however many days ago, and I'm guessing the app sent it to the old doctor instead of you, but, you know, please refill this medication for me. I got a message back from her roughly 10 minutes to midnight that night that she had approved the refill request, so it would be ready for me to pick up in the pharmacy tomorrow. And she was lowering the dose because she was taking me off the medication pronto, period. She wasn't even going to talk to me about this first, apparently. Uh, she also reprimanded me for not sending the refill request at least 48 hours in advance, even though I had a way to read my message, uh, and to set up a video appointment with her and complete a drug test. A couple days later and I have my meeting with her. She basically wanted to make it absolutely crystal clear to me that she was pulling me off of this medication, no question, no discussion, because it's very dangerous and life-threatening narcotics. So here's the thing as a pain patient. Doesn't matter what your background is, you know, if you sort of studied psychopharmacology, if you've done a lot of reading on the topics and read into what the side effects and risks and dangers are of a certain medication, opiate or not, you don't get to say that. Your opinion doesn't matter, at least in the U.S. It's whatever the doctor wants and good luck convincing them otherwise, especially on the opiates. Because if you do speak up too much or you seem too eager in trying to get your pain managed, you can get labeled a pill seeker, and that's on your record forever. And good luck ever getting that treatment option again. I did try to bring up that this is the best trade-off treatment option for me. I've practically exhausted the medication options. According to the HMO's own surgeons, surgery isn't really an option for this until I'm 20 years older at least. And the ketamine option isn't really an option, and I'll talk about more why later, but, you know, this is, this is the thing that's working the best for me, but it doesn't matter. I'm coming off it because it's too dangerous. I don't understand the risks. During the course of this call, she says several times that I'm free to find a new doctor. She says it often enough that it wasn't like a low-key subtext. It was like, just find a new doctor. I'm not dealing with you. And so the way it works on the HMO's app is you can't just talk to other doctors. In order to talk to a doctor, you have to switch to them as your primary doctor. So take a look on the website, who's accepting patients, and hope to God I got it right this time. I sent this new doctor a message saying, hi, new patient, trigeminal neuralgia, how's it going? And she replied saying that she looked over my chart. She also wanted to taper me, but to schedule a meeting with her to talk. 
So I did. She hit me with a wall of claims about opioids that was entirely scaremongering. Some were based on misrepresentations of papers I'd fucking read so could understand the nuance in the results that she was talking about. Some were just plain wrong, and others were based on Tylenol, which is the other big ingredient in Percocet and could easily be fixed by changing the medication I'm on. But she wanted me to talk to pain management. I told her I'd talk to them in 2019 and nothing came of it and held off that it was a waste of time. More on that in a sec. But no, no, no. She wanted me to talk to them again, see if they had anything new to offer me. Maybe something would mesh this time that hadn't the first time and promised me. She fucking promised that if I went through pain management and they thought that Percocet was the best option for me, she would honor that choice. She even mentioned that she had some patients already who had done that and she was prescribing for them. I just needed to go through the process. So I did. Because one does not go through pain management quickly, I got her to agree to hold off tapering further until we had an alternative in place. Foreshadowing. There is just so much foreshadowing in everything I've said up to this point. And to save you from having to dig through my entire back catalog, a quick reminder of what happened the first time through pain management in 2019. So this is pretty much right after we moved here, got myself a doctor, and he wanted me to see a neurologist about this, make sure it was trigeminal neuralgia, and have him deal with the treating of it. So see the neurologist, get the MRI done. Yeah, it looks like trigeminal neuralgia. You've tried these medications. Okay, let's try these other ones. And we pretty much hit the end of things I was willing to try and he was willing to prescribe. So he sort of threw his hands in the air and referred me out to the surgeon. And this was a surgeon in some pain specialist group who deals with trigeminal neuralgia. Like this is his, this is his shit. He knows it. Uh, so in my consult with him, he said that because I have like these flare-ups and the constant pain, I have atypical trigeminal neuralgia. Fair enough. Agrees with what I've read. Because of that, the surgery he would want to do, MVD, I think it stands for macrovascular decompression, probably wouldn't work. So that's out. Uh, gamma knife is out because he doesn't want to risk giving me brain cancer and because there other couple options aren't really options for me because of my age. So, cool. Uh, he referred me to an anesthesiologist who only suggestion really was a ketamine infusion. And as I mentioned in the Beyond Order video, they're all the rage these days. In my call with her, it became pretty apparent that it was going to be a practical and financial nope for the time being, at least. So the treatment involves a ketamine infusion three times a week for a couple weeks and seeing how my pain does. And if I was lucky, I might need to do it like three times a year, but it might need to be more frequent than that. And here's where the note comes in. So I would be needing to pay the specialist copay, which is like 70 or $80 three times a week and paying for an Uber to get to this clinic. Clinic's an hour away in good traffic. It's never good traffic. So conservative estimate of cost per week is $400. A couple weeks, every month, every couple months, you know, like that's a lot of money. That is a lot of money that I still don't have to throw at this problem. Then there is the more practical side of the nope where I watched videos of people who do this for pain and it seems like at the very least I would be out of commission for a day, if not the whole week, because I I tend to respond to things. It's it's my thing. Like I got the COVID vaccine and yeah, like I was out of commission for like a day and a half, because yay, my body. At that point in time, I was actively job hunting, so couldn't afford to be out of commission on an anesthetic if a job interview came up. Like <laughs> Uh, and now with YouTube, like I live and die by the algorithm. Me taking time off to deal with this is a very hard decision to make because I'm trying to keep relevance in the algorithm, but you know, my sanity. So taking time off, like that much time off every couple months, it just, no, no. 
another thing for the no pile that only occurred to me in the past couple weeks is ketamine has been used in an experimental manner with people with treatment resistant depression. So other medications and treatment options aren't helping them with their depression. So ketamine has helped some of these people not be depressed. Cool. But I'm not really depressed. Like I'm anxious as fuck. And, you know, I have some hopelessness associated with this medical situation, but you know, it's very situation specific and otherwise I'm okay. Like I'm doing okay. I don't need an antidepressant added to my equation. Like in my past experience with medications, when I'm here and an antidepressant's added, I get pushed manic. I don't need that. Like that's, that's bad times. Like let's not do that. And I imagine if this was voiced as a concern by me at some point, I probably would have been met with like, oh, we can just add, you know, something to counteract that. But those have side effects too. And like where I'm at with the Percocet, like the side effects are manageable. Why, why do we need to complicate things this much? Like, come on. But what do I know? Anyways, I told the anesthesiologist that it didn't seem like a financial possibility for me. And also I was job hunting at the time. Like I wasn't going to be able to do it at that time. And I think she was kind of annoyed that I was talking to her without the intent to follow through, but I could have read her tone wrong. Either way, she referred me to pain management. The meeting, singular, with the person from pain management was awful. Uh, she wasn't a doctor, I think. I don't remember what her degree was, but I don't think she was a doctor of medicine. And it was basically like troubleshooting almost. Like, step one, did you try this? Step two, did you try this? Was it effective? Like, just a list of stuff. And it's like, yes, I have tried this medication. Yes, I have tried group therapy. Yes, I have even tried acupuncture and all this other stuff. Like, was it effective? No, it wasn't acupuncture wasn't effective? No, weirdest thing. Sticking a needle into an angry nerve and leaving it there for 20 minutes only made it worse. Damnedest thing. Who'd have thunk? Something on the list I hadn't tried, or at least I didn't think I had tried, and always horrifies me that it's covered by my insurance. Chiropracty. Yes, get an adjustment to fix a nerve right here that's already fucked up. Like, Break your bones to fix a nerve here. Good job. Uh, but the thing is, I think I did inadvertently sort of almost have somebody do a chiropractor move on me at one point. So the guy who did the acupuncture also, in trying to deal with a flare, put a gloved hand in my mouth and started massaging back by like my molars and stuff. And it was weird. I hated it. It made it worse. Uh, but also may have been a chiropractor move uh, in watching some people, I'm not sure if it was Miles Power or who, talk about chiropractic and showing YouTube channels that do this. Um, that is a move that was employed by them. So yes, I apparently have tried chiropractic and no, it didn't work. It made it worse. But to get back to the point, this person from the HMO was peddling a bunch of woo at me and maybe the placebo effect would help some people and aromatherapy would work for some people with my situation, but it hasn't worked for me. Yes, I've tried. I have tried things. Thank you. And I was out $70 for this checklist of woo. I was, I was not happy. But this brought me back to my GP and... Yeah, full circle, and he just continued prescribing the medication with a little bump in the road. That was the update last time, but otherwise smooth sailing until he moved away. Back to the current situation. The first booking for pain management is in February, so I set up the appointment and find out that they've restructured how they do things. And on their website, they have all of their materials, so I dig around to see what I'm getting myself into. And I find slides upon slides upon slides of this is why we feel pain and this is your nervous system and this is your brain all on a level lower than I teach in intro psych. And I understand that this material needs to be accessible for all educational backgrounds. You know, you don't know who's coming in, so you need to make it accessible and understandable. I get that. But 
I know this stuff. Can I, can I test out of this? No? Cool. In the lead up to this appointment, which I found out was a group class, yay, uh, I noticed a very particular type of anxiety that I'd only really felt one time before when I was dealing with the bullshit with my dissertation. And as the situation developed, the parallels between the two only became more apparent. A general sense of uncertainty in what my future was going to be and my ability to have a good outcome sort of hinging on my ability to play the situation perfectly. If I fuck up in some way, I'm not going to get the outcome I desire. And if I don't get the outcome I desire, am I going to be able to continue to be productive in a way that I want to be? And in this case, not just constantly in pain. Uh, Moving goalposts down the field, which will become apparent later, as well as people who are either being obstructive or manipulative with me. Like, there's so many parallels, and I hate this anxiety. This means I've been having trouble sleeping, and this basically looks like me staying up until I am falling asleep doing whatever I'm doing, because if I go to bed not in that just going to pass out state, I will run scenarios in my head of conversations that could be had, what I need to say if doctor says this, what I need to say if doctor says that, like mapping out the full contingency plans that, you know, never pan out because the doctors never do what I expect. Um, driving myself nuts doing this, basically. And so to avoid that, I have to just throw off my sleep schedule entirely and try to just not go nuts in the meantime. And another consequence with this particular type of anxiety for me is if I'm not paying attention, um, I will catch myself just tensing up everything. Uh, so in bed, as I'm trying to fall asleep, you know, periodically like, nope, gotta check in, relax everything. And it can also be me waking up and just things are tensed. And lucky me, neck tension will cause this to flare. So it's been fun times. Class time rolls around, and it is a group class over a worse version of Zoom. And I'm the only person in attendance who has my camera off and knows how to mute myself. So until somebody showed up many minutes later who knew how to mute participants, and to get it out of the way before I just absolutely shit on this, some people did find it useful. I cannot take that away from them. Like, they learned stuff, they found a new way to think about the pain they were experiencing. I'm happy for them, but this was torture for me. The core pain management team is a person who manages and deals with medications, an anesthesiologist, a PsyD psychologist, and I'll explain that in a sec, and a physical therapist. In theory, each of these people will take a turn in this introductory class. In the first minute... I was already catching well-meaning but condescending vibes. Big props to you guys for getting up and finding the motivation to join this class. And that sort of vibe continued throughout this entire class. And again, I get that this might have been helpful and useful for some people, but it really rubbed me the wrong way. The anesthesiologist is supposed to start, but no one can find him, so one of the nurses just reads his portion of the slides and talks about what pain is. The psychologist is next, and her portion was about anxiety and how we feel it. We're told that pain can lead to an anxiety response because of a lack of control that you can experience, and because of that, all of us in this class were not able to really relax or be fully present in our lives and what we're doing because of the pain. All of us, just all of us in the class, including me, you know. I'm not feeling anxiety because of this entire situation and having to deal with this bullshit again. No, nope, it's, it's apparently because of my pain. Then, as a group, we practiced relaxing breathing, which was something I had been doing this entire fucking class to try to stave off a panic attack because of how bad my nightmares were of how all of this was going to play out. We're told that we will fix our pain. Fix our pain by learning how pain works 
and learning to move differently. And we can trust all of this because there's science behind it, as evidenced by a pixelated as fuck fMRI image that they don't bother to explain. But you know, you can trust it because brain. And I should mention that pretty much all of their material focuses on joint and muscle pain, not nerve pain. So this is great help for me. Between the general vibe in the call, the way that the people were talking, and sort of the pitch, I felt like I was being set up to join a cult. I made it through the class. Box checked. The next step was a four-hour evaluation by the pain management team, which was a couple weeks out. In the meantime, my prescription needed refilled again, because time's just flying by. So I messaged the doctor, let her know like I had the initial class, but you know, I'm going to be evaluated in a couple weeks. Nothing is really concrete yet. She refilled it, but she decreased the dose because she was starting me on that fucking taper she said she wouldn't start me on. So I messaged her again, like, hey, I thought we weren't going to start the taper until I had an alternative in place. She messaged me back. I thought talking to pain management was the alternative. I, yeah, that, that one hour class was just life changing. Fixed this fucked nerve I have just, whoop, no longer an issue. Like, no, that's not how this works. Mid-February and I had my evaluation and it wasn't one four hour thing. It was a three hour thing. It was a lot of things. So first I spoke to the medication person and it wasn't at all what I was expecting. Uh, it was basically just another list of things, if I tried them and if they were effective or not. Medication, tried it, yep. Effective, nope, and I got side effects. Medication, tried it, yep. Effective, yes, but not an option because thrombocytopenia, yay. Just tried it, effect, tried effect, tried effect, and my inference of this is she was just gathering info for the rest of the team and wasn't really a standalone thing. I also got a bonus call from a social worker. So in the intake paperwork, I had indicated that I was feeling a bit of anxiety and hopelessness and other things that would tick the box for anxiety and depression because the situation is not making me feel the best. And I had scribbled in, it's because of the situation, but apparently I ticked enough boxes that I had to speak to somebody and take an anxiety, depression, and suicidality questionnaire. Yay. And you know, explain to her that it's the situation. I understand I have anxiety, like I have bipolar. I understand what those feel like. This is specific to the situation and she was happy with that answer. So yeah. So then I had the evaluation, which took three hours between the psychologist, the anesthesiologist and the physical therapist. And I'm sure this block of time thing works great for their scheduling because then they can have a little chat after about stuff. And my inference is basically they're figuring out who of the three of them is going to take on each patient, like who best fits the needs of the person. But I'm sure the scheduling works great for them, but thinking at it from the other side, it seems kind of cruel almost, especially if somebody has like back problems or knee problems, making them take this call all in one sitting, just it doesn't seem right. First up was the psychologist and boy, was she excited to talk to another psychologist and asking me about, you know, do I have a private practice or who do I work for? Blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no, I, I am not that type of psychologist. I have zero counseling experience, cognitive, cognitive psychologist. And it got really awkward when I had to explain like what experimental psychology is to another psychologist. I think I've been pretty clear on this channel that I'm not a counseling psychologist. I have zero training in it, like it's not my thing, but I'm aware it exists and it was talked about in my intro psych class and some of the other classes I took, like I'm aware it's a thing. So I'm not sure how somebody got to a PsyD level and wasn't aware of the other at least half of psychology. By the way, a PsyD is short for psychology doctorate instead of philosophy doctorate like PhD. And basically you spend the same amount of time in grad school, but it's much more focused on preparing you for client work and there's no dissertation. So there's not really the research element involved. 
she was satisfied that I'm handling the pain psychologically okay and it's not limiting me and I'm still living my life and all that and suggested that I try the Kylo patch. I looked it up later and... Designed to boost the natural signals of the body and help the brain communicate with disrupted areas more effectively. Kylo contains billions of charged nanocapacitors that work like a bioantenna. Designed to assist the body in clear communication and to reduce signals that cause pain. Yeah. It is astonishing the amount of quackery that is being suggested by my medical professionals. Like, what the fuck am I paying these people for if this is all they're going to suggest? Just modern versions of snake oil. The anesthesiologist was next, and he was 15 minutes late to the call. I'm going to be nice and assume he was using that time to brush up on trigeminal neuralgia because it is kind of a rare thing. Um, you know, you would think he would have prep time for that, but I don't know. Maybe he's very busy. Uh, we spent five to ten minutes of that remaining time narrowing down just back and forth where exactly I feel my pain and what it feels like. Seriously, me saying, like, I'll use the other jaw so I don't irritate it, like, it's here, but this far in. What do you mean in? I mean in towards the center of my head. What do you mean in towards the center of your head? I mean, not that way, but like, if you went in that far, that feels like where the pain is. Okay, and where do you feel it from there? And like, it radiates up. What do you mean it radiates up? I mean, it feels like the anchor of the pain is in there and I can feel it extend up that way. Like, 10 minutes of that. <laughs> His diagnosis, counter to the surgeon that I spoke of who specialized in this, as well as the doctor I had years ago who seemed to give a shit and could do more than cursory research, was a combination of trigeminal neuralgia and atypical facial pain. His preferred treatment option would be two nerve blocks, one at the front of my face for the atypical facial pain, one at the base for the trigeminal neuralgia. And these would be a combination shot of an anesthetic and a steroid, and it would need to be done in an x-ray to help guide the needles to where they need to go. And the rare side effects or negative consequences are things like facial paralysis or leaking cerebral spinal fluid because whoops, went too far, punctured the skull, and now, you know, your brain juice is leaking out your nose. Uh, very rare, but you want me to be aware of them. Uh, other options were the ketamine infusion and a topical ketamine gabapentin gel to just rub on and that would do something. The last meeting was with the physical therapist, and I think she was mostly checking to make sure that I wasn't having like range of motion issues or mobility issues and wasn't favoring one side or the other or picking up habits that would lead to complications or further pain down the road. That was all hunky-dory. So she let me know that one of the nurses would call me in a couple days with the team's decision. Later that day, the anesthesiologist messaged me with more info on the nerve block and the ketamine stuff. So I've talked about the ketamine infusion already and how that's not really an option. Uh, the ketamine gabapentin topical cream, um, Googling that, I know the VA doesn't pay for it because in their studies it didn't do anything. Um, so either it doesn't really work for nerves, especially like deep, or if it does work, that's a problem for me because gabapentin wasn't a good experience, so no. Now for the nerve block. We're going to pause here for a sec to talk about why the nerve block isn't really an option for me right now, and also why I'm less than keen on throwing more random medications at this problem. And this is going to get pretty heavy, so timestamp somewhere to skip this. I've talked about my dad's death before, but not really the lead up into it and some of the consequences in it. I don't really remember when, but at some point my dad herniated a disc in his neck at work. And it was a work-related injury, but he was discouraged from filing a workman's comp claim, 
doing the school district a solid. I'm not sure why, but his doctors didn't want to pursue a surgical option and just told him that his body would deal with it in roughly 10 years. He just had to get to that point and it would be fine. And so getting to that point, they tried all sorts of things. Like uh, one of the things was a head strap that was connected to a water bag that was supposed to give him a little space there and ease the pain. And they also tried some medications to deal with the pain. At some point, they started my dad on a shiny new medication, and for the life of me, I can't remember what it was, and neither can my mom. Uh, details suggest it might have been Vioxx, but googling stuff from 20 years ago can be a little tricky. He also started using Flonase because he always had trouble with like his nose and his sinuses and stuff and thought it might help. After being on that for a little bit, he apparently developed a soft tissue infection that he went to the dentist for. So it must have been like the roof of his mouth, bottom of his sinuses or something. The dentist prescribed antibiotics. My mom and I didn't know about any of that. He must have been a couple days into his antibiotics when everything went down. He wasn't feeling good while out running errands the day before Valentine's Day. Called me at then boyfriend's house, let me know that he was going to the hospital because he thought there was something wrong with his potassium. It had happened before. Don't worry. Um, I picked up my mom from work, and we went home and waited to hear from my dad. Enough time passed where it got kind of weird, so we went to the hospital, and it turned out that he had flatlined once he got there, and they had tried to resuscitate him for 20 minutes, finally got his heart going again, and he was in the ICU. Because my dad got the antibiotics from somebody not connected in the medical network, Nobody knew he had this infection that was being treated. So, of course, that went nuclear. And to be quite frank, whatever brain function he had left after being deprived of oxygen for 20 minutes was likely cooked by a fever that they couldn't get control of for at least a day. It was over 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Like, it wasn't good. Years after all this had gone down, it randomly came up in conversation with my mom that the medication my dad had been on was involved in a class action lawsuit because people were having spontaneous cardiac arrests on it. Uh, she had decided at the time not to get involved with it because she couldn't be sure. So after having a close-ish call myself with one of the gold standards in treatment for trigeminal neuralgia, and my dad's death possibly being tied to trying a shiny new medication that had risks that they weren't entirely sure of, I'm not exactly keen on just throwing random medications at this problem anymore. I've tried at least 10, had varying levels of success with them, and also varying nastiness of side effects. Surely that's enough to say I've tried. My dad developing a soft tissue infection after having steroids in his sinus cavity make me kind of wary of injecting steroids into the close-ish regions of my face, especially from a doctor who is chronically late or absent from his appointments and won't reconsider his diagnosis of me, even though it disagrees with several other doctors, some more specialized in this than him, as well as my own understanding of the different forms of trigeminal neuralgia. So I wrote back to the anesthesiologist, briefly express my discomfort at doing the nerve block, and yeah. He wrote back, pretty box standard, let him know if I had any further questions, and that's sort of where it was. In the following days, I got a call from the nurse letting me know that the anesthesiologist would be overseeing things, and immediately launching into, you know, she can book me for an appointment, but it's going to be two months out, so I better book fast if I want to see him in the near future, blah 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 blah. And it's like, wait, 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 wait. Um, I'm a little confused because I thought I sort of reached the end of the road with the anesthesiologist. He wasn't really offering anything I'm comfortable doing or interested in, and I'm not sure what the next steps are. And so she was kind of confused about that, but I did get a useful piece of info out of this. In the referral to pain management, the doctor indicated that I wanted to come off the pain medication and was looking for things to help ease that process or alternatives. You will note that that is the exact opposite of what I had communicated to her in our call. 
To this day, I am still livid that she misrepresented my position like that, and that is in my record, and there is fuck all I can do about it. And I'm pretty sure there is fuck all I can do about it. Like, I can't amend it or anything because I called the HMO's nurse advice hotline, like, hey, so this situation happened, and it's not at all true of my feelings on things, and what can I do about this? And the nurse's suggestion was to take control of the situation, be assertive, and tell people exactly what I wanted. Even though, you know, that could potentially just bite me in the ass, that was the advice I was given. So with that new information in hand, I wrote the anesthesiologist back and apologized for the miscommunication and clarified what I thought I was seeing pain management for. And he also apologized for the miscommunication because, you know, we both were working from bad info and to let him know if I had any further questions or if things changed in the future. So not exactly a clean exit from pain management and certainly not a recommendation that I stay on the pain medication. Although sitting here thinking about it, they might never recommend that. So that might have just entirely been a fabrication. Either way, I was trying to set up a follow-up appointment with my doctor to talk about how all the pain management went and found out that she was going to be out of town until the beginning of April. So this got to be unresolved for another stretch of time. Monday, April 12th, finally have that follow-up appointment with the doctor and have my husband there as moral support because sometimes you can only be taken seriously as a woman when you have a guy present. Seriously. Despite having jumped through all of the hoops requested of me and honestly considering and weighing the options presented by the pain management people, the doctor let me know that she was going to take me off the only medication that's let me be mostly functional with this trigeminal neuralgia. And when I tried to say, like, you know, this is sort of the best trade-off for me and lets me work and be functional, she hits me with a gish gallop. I will end up ruining my marriage being on this medication. I will overdose at some point because this is such a high dose and it is such a dangerous medication. And I will develop dementia and on and on and on. Neither my husband or I could get a word in edgewise until she was done. And we tried because we both read those papers independently and knew she wasn't telling it to us straight, especially the part about our marriage falling apart or me accidentally overdosing. She was trying to manipulate me into agreeing. When she finally stopped, I said that we had read a lot of the literature on this and knew like some of the papers that she was talking about and mentioned that my husband's a physicist. You know, psychology will almost never get respect, but physics will. And we got different things out of these papers than what she was telling us. And so she flipped it back on us and said that my husband, as a physicist, understands how people age and so knows how this will play out. This meeting was a lot, so I don't remember exactly what my husband asked, but he asked something that she took to mean that he thought my pain wasn't real. He knows my pain is real, perhaps better than anybody else in this situation. Uh, but she went into this whole big thing about nerve pain being just as real as any other type of pain, blah, 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 blah. And he finally got her to stop, but he still couldn't get her to understand what he was actually asking. Another frustrating part was some of the things that she described as potential consequences are consequences from the Tylenol in the Percocet, not the opiates. And so if these were really her concerns, she could fix it by switching me to something that doesn't have the Tylenol in it. But that's not an option. We tried to emphasize that in the grand scheme of trade-offs, this has been my best option. The side effects aren't too bad. I've demonstrated that I can use this medication safely and haven't asked for increases, even though it's been stepped down on me repeatedly and not really as effective as a dose as it was. And, you know, it lets me be functional. Doesn't matter. I need to try the ketamine infusion just, just to try it. And I tell her, like, it's not an option. I can't afford to do it, both in terms of time off work and money. And so she offers to write me a doctor's note. And yes, I'm aware. I'm a YouTuber. I'm self-employed in that way. It's just me. I can do whatever. But I'm also at the whims of the algorithm and too much time away. And <laughs> so as far as she's concerned, I'm self-employed. There's no one else. It's just me, which is true. But... 
Also, just imagine this shit flying for any sort of retail job. You come in with a note from the doctor for two weeks time off. You think they aren't going to find some excuse to just fire you and find somebody else who doesn't need that time off? Not to mention lost wages if they don't fire you. Like, this is such a privileged thing to say. Towards the end of the call, my husband asked her what her end goal was. And interestingly, she changed it from weaning me off entirely to having me at 10 milligrams a day, a third of what I'm at right now. My husband said that I'm already at the breaking point of it losing an effective dose for me. And in another instance of her missing the point of what he was saying entirely, she says that what I should do is just stockpile on the easier days. So when I'm having a flare up day, I can take more, which is exactly the sort of behavior that I would think would lead to an accidental overdose like she was sort of warning about. So what the fuck? I am so done with this doctor. So it's pretty apparent that neither of us is going to budge. I note that we're at an impasse and that I would like to explore other options. And she says, go for it. And I don't remember exactly how I said it, but basically I don't want to burn the bridge entirely. And so I need her help in order to talk to other doctors because I can't do it on my own. So she agrees to get me a referral to another doctor as a second opinion and then goes on about no other doctor will, you know, tell you any different. It's all about these harms and these consequences, blah, 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 blah. But a little bit extra info makes it in this time. And I think it might have actually been her core concern. The new information was she didn't want to lose her license or get sued if something happened to me on this medication. So all of this talk about, you know, your marriage is going to fall apart, you're going to kill yourself, you're going to blah, 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 blah. All of that may have just been obfuscation and manipulation to get me to agree because she was really just concerned about protecting her best interests and not in treating her patient. So doing no harm in a slightly different way. Anyway, Find another doctor on the website who is accepting patients and have an appointment with him the following week. In the meantime, I'm left feeling absolutely hopeless in my situation because nobody who's in a position to actually help me seems to care that, you know, I've gone through so many medications and had side effects that were either life-threatening potentially or just not tolerable. And this is the best trade-off I've found. I'm taking the medication responsibly. I'm accepting the potential long-term risks for it. Like, nobody cares about that. There is a national mandate to get people off of this type of medication. Patients be damned, they're going to do it. So it seems that my choices then are to either just be in pain constantly, possibly to a point where I can't concentrate and work, or be stoned to a point where this is tolerable and it takes a bit to get there. Um, and so not really be mentally on top of things, not even talking about real world consequences of that, like not being able to drive, not being able to travel out of state, you know, there's consequences associated with medical marijuana use. Um, so I feel trapped and the system is stacked against me. And much like the situation with my dissertation, I reached a point where it felt like there was no hope, no future, and if the timing of what my husband was doing had worked out differently, I might not have survived that spot. Um, it was that bad. Anyways, two days later on the 19th, I have that second opinion visit with the other doctor and Let's just say that I'm glad all of these have been video calls and I haven't had to pay the copay because, yeah, a lot of the same ground, you know, there's all these risks. It's really the best thing to pull you off this medication, and if you were my patient, that's what I would do. But I'm not taking new patients, even though I'm on the website taking new patients. Uh, also, go vegan. That'll fix it. Uh, and also talk with neurology again. He set me up with a referral to a new neurologist because the neurologist I had seen had left the HMO at some point, weird, uh, and mentioned that this guy, guy, 
would be a good fit because he had a PhD background. And so, you know, we would really hit it off. Fine, whatever. In a potentially Shyamalan level plot twist, the call with the neurologist the next day didn't go bad. She, yes, she, I'm not sure what wires got crossed where, but whatever, uh, said that she read through my chart, saw that I had tried a lot of medications and had concerns with the different treatments or couldn't do them. And, you know, all of this put me in a really difficult position. Sort of being out of fucks at this point about everything and figuring that my life is just a future of pain, I tell her that I'm not too thrilled about being weaned off the only medication that seems to have worked for me, but am kind of resigned to my fate. And so she says that harm management can be a tricky thing sometimes, and really we need to weigh the all the risks and all the benefits when making these sorts of decisions. And she paused for a little bit and then said that she would talk to my doctor. At time of recording, it's been over a week and I haven't heard anything from any of the parties involved, so I'm not sure what's going on there. I got a weird email from a social worker at pain management that seems like it might be automated, but might not be. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, so yeah, we'll give it a little bit more time before following up with some of the people, but I'm honestly not in a place emotionally where I can think anything good will come of this. So yeah, that is the medical bullshit situation I've been dealing with this year and why I've been sort of pulled more into myself and not as responsive to things as I'd like to be. I'm also still dealing with emotional aftershocks of the terribly dark place I found myself in. I'm okay. I'll be okay. Uh, just I'm under one doctor husband's orders to take a week or two off and deal with it and process it and just take some time for myself. So the next Dryer video is coming. It just might be a little bit later than originally planned. You guys have been nothing but supportive of things happening in the past. So don't take this video as like a panicked explanation or apology for things like you guys are great. I don't feel like I have to do that so much as just clarify and explain about this vague thing that's been sort of in my orbit pulling at me. Maybe this video will help someone. Maybe this video will help clarify for people how chronic pain patients can be treated in this country. Maybe this will just be another video that exists on the internet. Either way, um, until next time. <laughs>